anywhere between two to three thousand uh, truckers are stuck in very long lines in freezing temperatures. Uh, two Ukrainian uh, truckers have died. They're threatening to, you know, continue protesting for months and months. Some people are saying that Ukraine could suffer, like, you know, losses of one percent of its GDP as a result of this. So it's hundreds of millions of dollars. When Ukrainians come and say, like, you know, you're stabbing us in the back, the Poles feel a little bit like, okay, guys, come on, you know, <laughs> like, do you not really appreciate how much we've helped you? How is Ukraine going to integrate into the European Union when the time comes? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be rough. Plain and simple. Like, it's not going to be an easy process. Hi, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Ukraine, a show where the newsroom of the Kiev Independent explains Ukraine's biggest events in just under 30 minutes. I'm your host, Anastasia Lapatina. Today, I'm joined by our business editor, Lillian Bivings, to talk about the Polish trucker protests at the Ukrainian border crossings and why, a month later, Ukraine and Poland still haven't resolved the crisis. Lily, welcome. Thanks for having me. Before we go on, I'll remind you guys to please subscribe to The Kiev Independent wherever you're listening to the show, whether that's in YouTube or on audio platforms. Leave comments, reviews, likes. It takes uh, just a few seconds for you, but it goes a really long way for us because that is exactly what helps YouTube and other platforms promote our podcast so more people will be informed about Ukraine. So, Lily, we brought you here today to talk about the situation at the Ukrainian-Polish border, where Polish truckers have been effectively blocking um, several crossings for around a month now. So tell us, what exactly has been going on there? Yeah, so since November 6th, Polish truckers have been blocking three border crossings with Ukraine over what they say is unfair competition uh, from Ukrainian truckers. Um, Since... No, as of November 27th, I believe, they've been blocking a fourth border crossing as well. Uh, and in total, Poland and Ukraine have eight border crossings. So it's not all of them, but it's a, you know, it's half. Um, and I mean, at this point, it's like thousands, from anywhere between two to 3,000 uh, truckers are stuck in very long lines in freezing temperatures. Uh, two Ukrainian uh, truckers have died. Well, the Polish police say one, Kiev says two. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, negotiations are going nowhere. Why exactly has this been happening? Like, what are the protesters' complaints and demands? So, following Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, in June 2022, the EU lifted uh, these permits for the Ukrainian truckers to be able to enter the EU. And what Polish truckers are saying is that now, because they can get in without these permits, they're able to offer lower prices for logistics services mm-hmm. and, and are basically undercutting Polish truckers um, who can't compete with their Ukrainian prices because they're bound by these strict EU regulations. Right. The Polish truckers are also complaining that on the Ukrainian side, there's this sort of regist- e-registration program that Ukraine has where Ukrainian truckers can get back into Ukraine much quicker than Polish truckers can, which they also say is creating an unfair advantage. Um, And the Polish truckers are demanding uh, that the EU reinstate uh, these permits. Um, And they're basically saying that, you know, only at the EU level can this decision be made to to reinstate these permits because it was the decision was originally made um, at that level. And the permits were canceled because of the whole terrible situation with the grain blockade by Russia, right? So this was to yeah. ease Ukrainian export. Of course, right. So the blockade uh, of Ukraine's Black Sea exports by uh, Russia um, is what created the situation in the first place. I mean, most of Ukraine's exports uh, used to used to go out uh, through its Black Sea ports. And so, right, so what, was, so what the Polish truckers are saying now is kind of like, well, what was supposed to just be something to help Ukraine get its exports out um, because of the Black Sea blockade, is now kind of creating this this uh, unfair advantage for Ukrainian truckers and this problem for Polish truckers. Um, and you know, uh, there's just no end in sight right now for, in terms of the negotiations. It's just going nowhere. I mean, is there is there any evidence to support the claims that you know this unfair advantage is actually causing substantial problems and like disturbing Polish markets, etc.? Yeah, I mean, both the Polish and the Ukrainian side have said that before the full-scale invasion, there was something like 160,000 permits annually given to Ukrainian truck drivers to enter the EU. In a year, that number has jumped to almost a million. Uh, So, I mean, it's a big change. That is a huge change. 
However, uh, what the Polish side doesn't mention is that it's not just that the Ukrainian truckers are entering more and they're undercutting them. There's the, the whole situation has changed, right? So Polish trucking companies used to employ a lot of Ukrainian truck drivers who have, for one reason or another, gone back to Ukraine, um, maybe to fight in the military, to help out in other ways, gone back to their families. And now they can't leave Ukraine again to work for the Polish companies that they may have before. Right. So like the Polish trucking industry has lost some of its uh, drivers, Ukrainian drivers that previously worked in it. Secondly, um, you know, Polish truckers are not going into a lot of the areas that they used to in Ukraine because for security reasons. And Ukrainian drivers are more willing to, to go into those areas, right? Um, so Polish truckers are losing out on, on that as well. And there's also the, just the simple fact that like demand has changed in Europe. The, like the, there's less demand in Ukraine for you know, the, tr- the logistics industry in general. Um, so there's just less business for Polish truckers. Um, and just in general, in Europe, there's less demand because of the economic situation created because of Russia's war. So there's a lot of things that are going into, uh, there's a lot of factors as to why the industry has changed. Oh, and of course, Polish truckers have lost business in Belarus and Russia because of sanctions, because of the war in mm-hmm. general. Um, and so that's also cr- created a problem for their business. So it's not just like Ukraine's fault and the Ukrainian truckers uh, that are now entering and undercutting them. There's a lot of factors. And who exactly are these truckers? Um, is it some sort of like union-led effort or an individual effort um, or a national effort? to protest against these things? So the leader is this guy named Rafał Meckler. I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, and he is a Polish trucker. He owns a Polish trucking company. Um, and he is linked to the Confederacja party in Poland, which is a very conservative party in Poland that has ties to Russia. Um, it's definitely expressed anti-Ukrainian sentiment, for sure. Um, And I mean, there's been a lot of reports about Meckler and the other truck, Polish truckers' connections to Russia and and um, to Russian and Belarusian companies. Um, so there's that group, and they're the ones who kind of started all of this. But at the same time, I mean, you have Slovak Trucker Union also, you know, joining in or, or threatening to, to block uh, the border uh, with Slovakia and Ukraine. Um, There's also other far-right and conservative politicians in Poland have visited the border. Um, you have the, the farmers who staged these massive grain protests uh, last year who have also joined in. So it's not just one group, but it is, I mean, we can say that the, the, the thread between all of the people is definitely sort of a conservative right-wing uh, one. But yeah, it's a... It's, um, There's various the various factors there. And what are the governments of Ukraine and Poland doing or they're not doing to stop this? Because to be honest, I'm extremely surprised that something like, you know, protests by truckers at a border can take so long to resolve. Like, uh, you know, I, I thought that this would be over in a matter of weeks. But here we are. And as you said, they're, they're threatening to, you know, continue protesting for months and months. So this border crisis has caught Poland between two governments. There were elections, uh, government is still being formed, uh, and the current government like is not going to take on an issue this big uh, just because, you know, they're on their way out. And, I mean, there's just no one really to make a decision about this. Um, the Ukrainian side, for its part, understandably so, has made a lot of really kind of emotional remarks to the Polish side, Which like, I've read have only kind of made it worse, right? I mean, yeah, they've said that this is a stab in the back, that this is economic genocide. Uh, wow. Yeah, which are completely understandable given Ukraine's position and Ukraine's difficulty in managing its economy, especially exports during Russia's full-scale invasion. Um, but it hasn't helped like smooth things over in negotiations. Definitely. It's only just made things more heated. Um, and that's, you know, um, there's this kind of, like um tension right now between poland and ukraine which is that like the poles feel like they've done so much for ukraine and, and they we, have and they have yeah and and when ukrainians come and say like you know you're stabbing us in the back the poles feel a little bit like okay guys come on you know like do you not really appreciate how much we've helped you so it's like 
but at the same time, I mean, yeah, obviously this is going to be heated. Um, and like recently there was kind of one bright spot where the Polish and Ukrainian sides agreed that they would let empty trucks uh, pass uh, through the border, um, which is like, you know, a good sign. It's some sort of negotiations. Uh, but I mean, empty trucks going into Ukraine doesn't help like Ukraine's imports, for example, right? I mean, like that doesn't, and it could lead to shortages. It could lead to higher prices. So basically you just have to wait until Poland has a new government and that new government will be led by Tusk, who is pro EU um, politician. And of course the EU stance on this is that they're not going to, you know, give in to the Polish protesters. They're not going to let themselves get bullied by an EU member once again, after the grain protests happened and they, you know, um, implemented this ban on certain, allowed the, the, the ban of certain agricultural products into EU countries from Ukraine. Um, and even after that, they lifted that ban. Poland imp- uh, implemented its own unilateral bans, which is totally in defiance of EU right. trade law. Like it's the, illegal. The, right. Like uh, an EU member cannot do that. So I think this time around, uh, the EU is like, no, no, we're not going to get, you know, uh, bullied by you. And so they're basically just saying, like, Poland needs to stop this. And no, we're not, you know, sort of bending to your will this time. So hopefully I think when, when Tusk is in there, he will be able to um, put an end to them somehow in a way that does not look like what happened last year with the grain bans and agricultural product bans. So it looks like Poland is have to is going to have to figure out the problem with truckers kind of on its own, like via some sort of monetary support to truckers or because it looks like no one is expecting Ukraine to change its rules and laws of border crossings, right? No, I mean, there might be something. I think the the Polish side, uh, the Polish truckers want to be a part of this e-registration system that Ukraine has where it can also get in faster. So maybe there'll be some negotiations on that. But but. No, I mean, I think the, the EU is expecting the, the incoming Polish government to, to, to take charge of that. To deal with it and to yeah. put an end to it, however you need to do that. I don't know. So what have been the monetary consequences of all of this? Can we put a number on it? Because I've seen some really high numbers in the Ukrainian media on the cost of these blockades. There's been a lot of different numbers. Uh, even in our reporting, uh, there just seems to be like different numbers. I mean, the U- um one of the business associations, uh, the European Business Association, um, said that basically uh, out of a survey of 55 companies that they did, these companies are losing like around $30,000 a day on this. Um, but then the Federation of Employers of Ukraine um, has put like the total economic losses at something like $400 million. Um, I think exports are down between October and November, uh, like 200 million. Some people are saying that Ukraine could suffer like, you know, losses of 1% of its GDP as a result of this. So it's hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really, it's hard because we've talked to some companies in our reporting, uh, Ukraine, like large Ukrainian retailers who have said like, we've managed to get around it by switching to railroad transport or going to other border crossings. So yeah, it's costing more uh, for companies, but there's ways around it. Um, so it's, We'll see. I mean, certainly if it keeps going, um, Ukrainian companies are expecting some shortages. If there are shortages, um, if it's more expensive to import things, obviously those uh, costs will be passed on to the consumers. So prices will be higher. Right. So it's, you know, it's a bit early to kind yeah. of I mean, yeah. estimate huge I consequences. So. Right. Right. But I think it's more just that it's just very disruptive to the economy. It's disruptive to Ukraine's political situation. It's just it's very, very disruptive. Um, it takes it, money and time to right. figure this bureaucracy right. out, and we don't have either just of those. deal with it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what about the humanitarian and military aid uh, that is crossing the border? Because we have huge amounts of that coming in daily as well. Is that being blocked too? Technically, no. Technically, the Polish truckers are only blocking commercial goods. Uh, they're letting in humanitarian aid, military aid. But there have been reports that some things have ended up being blocked, like some military aid, humanitarian aid has, you know, ended up being a part of the blockade. So, of course, that's an issue. But mostly it's just commercial goods. And so is Poland the only country, uh, the only Ukrainian neighbor uh, that's kind of, you know, experiencing these border tensions with Ukraine? Because as we've mentioned, there were several countries who were very unhappy about Ukrainian green experts in the past. So, No, I mean... um, 
it's not just Poland. Um, it's uh, there was a, a statement that was put out by the representatives of truckers from Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, uh, the Czech Republic, and Lithuania. Actually, so I mean, it's not just Poland that's affected by this. You know, and the statement said that you know they need to put an end to this permit-free um, situation situation for for Ukrainian truckers. Um, and so, no, I mean, I mean, it's, it might be a case that this what's happened in Poland is, is sort of spreading because they're inspiring others to to think about it, you know, and, and to protest. But I think that it's just um, the economic changes that have happened to Ukraine's neighboring countries, because, of course, the neighboring countries are going to be the ones that feel the changes the yeah. most. Right. So, of course, they're going to complain about these things. Of course, they they have uh, created changes in their industries. And um, so it's, yeah, it's, and, it, and I think the, the one country where it's actually kind of at risk of really spreading is Slovakia, where they've, they've threatened to, to close borders. There are some protests happening. All um, of this so. got me thinking, yeah. like, how you how is Ukraine going to integrate into the European Union when the time comes? Uh, if, like, this tiny amount, like, relatively tiny amount of exports is causing such a big issue already within just a few months. I mean, Ukraine is a huge agricultural producer like how, how are we gonna do we have any plans or like what, what what's gonna happen yeah i mean it's gonna be rough plain and simple <laughs> like it's not going to be an easy process and i think this is actually a good like um trailer kind of preview <laughs> yeah exactly like a preview for people to see what this is gonna look like there's just gonna be showdown after showdown after showdown because a all of these countries especially the boarding countries um, are going to have their own like things with Ukraine that like they're going to feel that Ukraine is creating competition for especially in agriculture that's and, inevitable right right I mean Ukraine is an agricultural powerhouse the cliche is that it's the breadbasket of, of Europe which it is um, and like essentially all of these countries know that once Ukraine gets into the EU it's going to create massive competition for them it's also going to create lower prices for people around the EU right um, but you know, they're, they're, I think these countries are going to do whatever they can to try to mitigate this as much as possible through these negotiations. However, it's inevitable. Like it's just Ukraine is going to cost the EU a lot of money in the beginning because, of course, like uh, the EU has these subsidies um, for agricultural land, and by like the amount of hectares you have, you get these subsidies. So Ukraine is looking at like you know, I don't know, tens of billions of dollars in subsidies from the EU. So of course they're going to complain about that. They're going to complain about competition. But this is the exact same thing that happened when. Poland and Hungary and all these countries joined the EU, like, especially even with truckers, there was this whole thing where the Germans were complaining that the Polish truckers were undercutting, undercutting their business and, mm -hmm. you know, providing logistics uh, at a lower cost. And also like complaining that basically like companies can pay a Polish, well, at the time I right, could pay a Polish driver much cheaper than they could pay, they would pay a German. It's, gonna, it's the same thing is going to happen uh, with Ukraine, right? Uh, it's already, I mean, that's what the Polish can, truckers are complaining about now is that basically like they can't compete with the low prices that uh, Ukrainian trucking companies offer. So, I mean, yeah, we're just, we're headed for a showdown, but like, and the, the unfortunate thing is that like people's memories are very short. And I was just going to say, how come <laughs> it's still taking so long to resolve if, with like we've been here before? I mean, because no one re remembers 2004, like, come on, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> so, um, and, but what they will remember is like these grain protests, uh, in Poland and the, the grain bans and they'll remember these trucker protests and they'll remember all of this bad blood. And so like that, it's going to, we're going into negotiations with all of this, you know, tension already. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be very difficult. We're now moving to the community question of this episode. You guys should go to kivindependent.com slash membership to support us there and become a member of our community. There is an option for a one-time donation and also an option for a monthly support for as little as $5 a month. And you get really cool perks. Of course, our favorite perk is that you get to send us in questions before every single episode of this podcast. And we try to incorporate as many of them as we can all throughout. So the question we're going to be answering today is, Actually, something we already mentioned briefly, uh, the links to Russia, uh, so the links between Russia and the Polish truckers who are protesting. The member says, I have recently read that the Polish organizers of the blockade had links with both the extreme right and the Russians, making them an ideal tool of Putin's policy to hurt and strangle Ukraine's economy. Can you confirm or dispute this claim? I mean, I cannot confirm uh, the claim, obviously, <laughs> And I, you know, right off the bat, like, 
we should say, yes, these groups that are carrying out these protests are conservative politically. They are members of, you know, right wing parties that do have ties to Russian business or had in the past ties to Russian businesses, maybe still do um, definitely have expressed anti-Ukrainian sentiments. Are they agents of Russia? Are they paid to do this? Again, we, I mean, we can't confirm that. We don't know that. Um, I mean, I wouldn't put it past Russia for trying to do this or for at least having some sort of hand in it, just like, you know, when we're talking about the U.S. elections of Donald Trump, Russian disinformation campaigns certainly were at work there, right? Yeah. Did Russians take everybody's hand and make them vote for Trump in the United States? No, no. right? So, I mean, it's like, yes, they probably have an influence there, right? Um, but are they also like behind it? Behind yeah. it, I mean, we can't say. And I, and for me, it's like, you know, these truckers are worried about their bottom line. They're worried about how much money they make. They're worried about their own families. They have their own concerns. And the, um, the legitimate concerns, yeah, as we right? discussed. Uh, about the economic changes happening as a result of Russia's war. I mean, at the end of the day, this isn't Ukraine's fault. This is Russia's fault, right? But, so in that sense, Russia is behind yeah, it, yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's like, you know, um, they... Uh, are probably protesting because they are, uh, you know, there is some sort of anxiety about the, the economic changes that are happening. I think we should really caution people against um, kind of assuming that everything that in some way doesn't benefit Ukraine or says something ne negative about Ukraine, that that is some sort of Russian disinformation operation or, you know, Russian agents doing this. Because unfortunately, I see this very often especially in the Ukrainian society, but then also abroad. It's like every time anything even remotely bad happens, oh, of course, it's Russia. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's, I don't know, R Russian intelligence services. Like, unless we actually see evidence of that, I don't think it's clever to assume that because sometimes Ukraine also, you know, messes up. We may also create, you know, like negative circumstances for certain groups of people who are unhappy about that. A great example of that is like how... In Ukraine, sometimes people smear Western journalists, right? Like, it's, or even their own journalists, or or their own journalists, because it's pretty much impossible to say or write anything negative about Ukraine without being accused of being a Russian agent. Yeah, I mean, we the, the people to keep independent are accused of this. I mean, it's absurd, right? Like being a Russian agent if we write something negative about the Ukrainian government or about the war, um, right? And so it's. It's very convenient for the Ukrainian side when this Very. narrative is out there. Um, you know, it may have even... It's, it's, prob it's a narrative that's probably pushed by the Ukrainian government. Of course it is. Um, mm -hmm. But you can't just say... When something happens that you don't like, you can't just say it's like a Russian agent, you know, or it's <laughs> Russia. Like, unfortunately. You very know, very it often it easy. is, but, but... Well, they have their hand in yeah. there somewhere. I mean, at the end of the day, all of this is Russia's fault, right? Like the economic changes yeah. and the hardship that these truckers may or may not be facing is Russia's fault. Um, and so it's... But he, the thing is, is it's very convenient um, for Russia when these things happen regardless. So even if their hand isn't there or they haven't financed it or they haven't you know created this problem uh through disinformation campaigns or tried to create um these situations play right into their hand anyway um yeah but, it, but i think it's really important for us to talk about that like just because something's happening that we don't like uh, and it may benefit russia right uh doesn't mean that we can just uh say russia's doing it um and and uh, I think it's important to caution against that also, not only because it just may be false and you know, un untrue and that doesn't help the information space, but also because that absolves whoever is actually responsible of responsibility and the push to like actually do something about it, right? So right. instead of going out there and like trying to fix these very real economic problems between the two friendly allies, we're just going to, you know, say that, you know... Oh, yeah, trade maybe. blame back and forth. Right? Yeah, you're, yeah, just, yeah. you're just trading blame right, and right. blaming Russia, and that's where it ends. Right. Like, no, you actually have to solve the issue. Right, like the, the Polish side that's, you know, very conservative says like, oh, these Ukrainians are just spoiled brats at this point. This is crazy. You know, we've given them enough. Mm -hmm. Why can't they just calm down and, you know, mm -hmm. um, and go back to things as they were? I mean, even though the war is still very much going on here, Ukrainians can't. Mm -hmm. They can't export things out of the Black Sea. They need these this, this road transport. They yeah. need railway transport. So, like, the Polish side is unjustified in, like, this, like, oh, why are you whining, <laughs> you know? And then the Ukrainian side is, is, is 
partly unjustified in saying like, oh, it's just a Russian, you know, disinformation campaign against us. It's like, well, no, right? Like, Neither like you, of those things are true. Rightly said, I mean, it, it, it uh, gets in the way of actually properly addressing um, the problem. Russia is very good at stirring the pot. Um, and then and, exploiting. And exploiting. So I'm sure, so these Polish truckers probably had these issues or that were felt this way. And there may have been some sort of disinformation campaign to really fan those flames on social media on, I'm not really sure, but that's kind of how, that's kind of their MO, right? It's like, you see a problem that already exists in a certain society and you just go over there and like exploit it and try to make it way worse uh, with disinformation until it Mm -hmm. explodes. And I mean, it's hard to like prove that, but that's, that's, that's their special, that's the Russian specialty. So, you know, I mean... Yeah, hopefully with the new government in Poland, which is yeah, pro-Western, EU-friendly, uh, this this will get resolved uh, pretty quickly. Well, Lily, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. Also this week, the U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken announced a defense aid package worth $175 million from previously directed drawdowns, calling it, quote, one of last defense aid packages if Congress fails to pass additional funding. The U.S. Justice Department has charged four Russian soldiers over the unlawful detainment and torture of a U.S. citizen who was residing in Ukraine in a historic case the department's Office of Public Affairs announced on December 6th. And a pro-Russian former lawmaker, Ilya Kiva, was found dead in Moscow on December 6th. According to the Kiva Independent sources in law enforcement, Kiva's death was a special operation conducted by the security services of Ukraine, known as SBU. You can find our show on YouTube and all audio platforms every Friday morning. If you like this episode, please subscribe to us and like our content wherever you're listening to this show. Go to kivindependent.com membership to support our work by donating and becoming a member of our community. And follow us on social media on Facebook, Instagram, and X. We'll be back next week. Thank you for watching.